What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and I'm back with another video. Got something a little bit different for you today. In this episode, we're gonna talk to THC Titan. I say we because it's not just me. Chris from Happy Hydro is also joining me on this. And full disclosure, this is an old episode. It was actually filmed um, a couple years back. It was on a different YouTube channel. That YouTube channel got deleted. And there's some really good information in this. So I figured a re-release would be worthy. So this is actually an episode from a podcast. The podcast was called Happy Hour. And uh, the host is Chris from Happy Hydro. I was the co-host. Um, I don't speak very much in the episode. This is more of like an interview with THC Titan. The topics that we cover is grow room setup. We also talk a little bit about breeding and then we finish off the episode talking about environment. And like I mentioned, this was filmed a couple years back. So I'm sure THC Titan's grow room setup is different now. Uh, head on over to his channel. You can see his most up-to-date setup. This is actually the first episode of the podcast, so it's a little bit all over the place as far as flow. Also, for the first five minutes when THC Titan is talking, it's kind of like cutting in and out. Hang in there. It's just for five minutes. It's super annoying, yes, but um, if you can get through that first five minutes, it's clear from there on out. I actually have three more of these podcast episodes. Uh, this one that you're about to watch is really just audio only. Um, the other three that I have, I believe two out of the three, I have video as well. So if I do end up releasing those, I will include the video as well. All right, I've rambled on enough. Let's get into the episode. Hey, everybody. I'm Chris, and I'm here with Mr. Grow It. What's up, man? What is going on? Not much. We got THC Titan here. How you doing? Really well. I appreciate you guys having me on and uh, getting a chance to uh, chat with you guys. Yeah, no problem, man. Um, we'd like to talk to you about your grow methods and some of the equipment you use. And um, I guess where we would like to begin is pretend you're walking into your grow room. Can you kind of like tell me what you see and like how your setup goes? Yeah, sure. So right when you walk in, let's see, have it's basically a 15 by 12, uh, and I have two. Adjust wings nearest me, air conditioner, uh, about 15,000 BTU, three air-cooled double-ended hoods. So I'm running all double-ended in the room. And basically, I run like a Scrog screen or green style. The, the trellis is only there for support, but it looks, you know, like a traditional Scrog. But you'll see some tops shoot up here and there. But yeah, so and then I have a walkway in the middle, but flower is just going to be a sea of green. That's all you're really going to see. And yeah, it's pretty nice 5,000 uh, watts right now, and we're assumed to some around 6,000. Damn, dude, that sounds pretty legit. Um, I looked at your video, and I saw that you have a carbon filter and a fan mounted in the room. Right, yeah. Um, is that constantly exhausting, like, while your air conditioner is running? Like, does it, does it exhaust some of your cold yeah. air? Yeah, I have it set to a, a Zephyr 3 controller by Titan Controls, I believe, and it's it has a temperature set point. So, and it'll dial up and dial down based on what you set it at. So you can set it at like 95 and that's 100%, and then you set your low end like 63, and then that's 0%. So as it gets closer and closer to that warmer range, you'll slowly ramp up. So. I would say when I'm running my 81 degrees, I usually run, I would say it's running at about 40% maximum. So just barely like it's a canopy. That's awesome, Works dude. extremely well. Yeah, and that controller is pretty legit. Is that an expensive controller? I mean, it sounds like a pretty legit setup. Like $90, pretty cheap, actually. You know, considering for what it does. It's basically just a, a sensor on the little uh can go out so it's not sitting you know like against the wall or down on the floor so you can kind of put it right. out in your hottest point so it's not like the, the, the it doesn't monitor your co2 or do you use co2 yeah i run co2 at just above uh ambient at like 700 parts per million so nothing crazy usually in the 700 to 900 range so just enough to keep it up above and to a point where i'm not um expending a lot you know on gas because it can get expensive if you're, if you're just uh, exhausting it out of the room in that manner but this, this way it's slowly pulling it across can i go through them every two weeks which is not that bad oh you said a tank every two weeks yeah 
Oh yeah, that's not, that isn't yeah. too bad. And have you ever like done a side by side or an experiment where you've ran seven hundred ppms and then like twelve hundred or? Well, I've been running CO two for about a year now, so I've been slowly working my way up. I started around uh, five hundred up to 900 so i'm only increasing it 100 at a time so i can kind of see the results and what right now the 900 seems like a sweet spot because i have a burner so uh turn on when the, the uh, ambient co2 gets below the set point and uh when it when it's turning on too often for me my temperature gets uh, a little bit too high so this would be a sweet spot for me and my next my next row will be fully sealed so the burner won't have to turn on as often that's awesome dude i um your your air conditioner now is that like a mini split the air conditioner is just a uh portable dual hose uh you know, just from home depot um the hose gets exhausted the hot air gets exhausted to the attic and in the attic i have the filter and then it pulls all the hot air from the attic and then exhausts it outside so you there's not that build up a carbon filter in the attic, did you say? Eight inch fan. For fans, are you buying like the most expensive can fan or are you just using like regular eight inch fans from Amazon or eBay? Well, I, typically I like the Max fans. I've had nothing but reliability from them and you know, and their can fans, but uh, the cheapest fan I can get only because I know it's going to be running at a very high temperature and it's probably going to die sooner than later. I, I give it a life expectancy of about six months, to be honest, because all that hot air running through that fan is going to break down any electronical component or motor components over time. And you said it was a max fan that you're using or no? It's a uh, value line. Just gotcha. the okay. one I could find. Because yep. you knew that you were going to be beating on it. Yeah, I knew it was eventually it's going to, you know, the motor is going to overheat. Yeah, max fans have been extremely reliable for me. The, my 10 inch one that I have, I've had for about five years now running almost constantly so it's really 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 reliable and do they have yeah. different uh size models like do they have six inch eight inch so on and so forth yeah six to uh 12 for their um for the style that i have i forgot what they call it but like their max fan i think it is i got a buddy who has a max fan who's who he's had it for like five or six years too and still running like a champ what kind of medium are you growing in are you growing in pots or Cocoa. Yeah, uh, I grow t my flower rooms typically uh, number ten containers with pure cocoa. Um, I've tried a few different brands. Um, some of them I don't like. I've had bad experience with. Uh, like uh, I don't know. I don't want to say anything bad about companies, but basically, the best cocoa I've ever tried is either um, can of cocoa or uh, cloud core or charcoal cocoa. Always great results from both of those. And do you hand water or do you set up a drip or something? I'm um, hand watering currently, but this next round I should have the uh, floor flex installed and I'll have it set up on automatic watering, which will be nice to kind of document and show everybody how to do it if they're interested. Yeah, that's sweet. You'll be showing that on your YouTube channel? Yeah, for sure. THC Titan is the channel, everybody. Um, I have never seen the what, floor flex you said? Yeah, the floor flex is like an octa bubbler system, if you're familiar with those. So basically... They built it. Usually, you have to build them on your own. It only, only comes with the head, but the floor flex comes fully built out. And all you do is basically glue it into your PVC and plug in your hoses, and you're good to go. And it even has an adjustable valve on it, so you can adjust e each eight site, you know, pressure uh, based on what you like, which will work out great for me because I have on one side I have smaller plants, and the other side I have bigger plants. So I'm going to set up the floor flex, you know, accordingly and adjust the pressure from there. And that, so that's that's not a hydro system. It's just a watering system for the cocoa. A drip system, yeah, correct. Drip system, gotcha. Yeah, I'll have to check that out after the show. Do you? So, is your? Are you on like a concrete floor or anything? Do you have to keep your plants off the ground or? Um. So where I'm growing is basically a a, a home that I've basically blown out, you know, into gotcha. a a a grow house, you know, like you know, and then. So I have my main flower room, which is uh, carpeted, and then two layers of uh, panda film on top. And so it, I don't have to worry about any kind of like um, root damage from temperature and whatnot. 
Yeah, because uh, I know a lot of people have dealt with that, like growing in basements and just putting the plants on the floor and not really knowing what they're doing. And then having the cold temperatures from the floor uh, screw up the roots. Yeah, especially if you have like cloth pots, it's like just magnified even more intensely because there's not that plastic barrier in between. I had an issue with that in my, I had to grow with a partner and it's probably on my YouTube channel, like one of my first two or three videos I uploaded. Um, and it has the, uh, the concrete floors and uh, we were getting solar growth and we didn't have any kind of uh, barrier in between the concrete. And then later, like four months later, I finally realized, oh my gosh, you know, when it's winter, why does everything slow down? Well, that's why, because of cold concrete. The fact that you were able to pinpoint that problem, I mean, a lot of people just might never figure that out. Like, did you switch to plastic pots after that or? Yeah, actually we did. Yeah, we switched to number 10s, bigger pots. And I was like, oh, it's just the bigger pots. And no, it, yeah, it turns out that, you know, because we adjusted everything. We turned down our, you know, got our vi environment dialed in, you know, dehumidifiers and everything and whatnot. And the growth still wasn't picking up like it should have. But then we switched. We ran a few tester plants in number 10s and the growth was way better I'm like wow it must be the medium because it was a little bit more medium like two more gallons worth of medium but yeah then later i connected connected the two so almost stumbled upon it and are the number tens are those 10 gallon pots or uh they're just below 10 gallon gotcha what are you using for nutrient lineup and additives so nutrients uh i kind of run whatever basically to be honest with you uh, nutrients really aren't that important in my eyes um last round i ran nectar for the gods ran their whole line and got pretty good results so i was happy with it but the uh, the amount of work and just the overall cleanliness of it, it i'm not really a fan of even though it is an all or 90 some eight percent organic but from the earth basically uh line i i like that you know that's that's nice but I'm not outdoors, so I'm not really worried about runoff and adding uh, salts, I guess you would say, chemicals, as most people would say, to the uh, to the ecosystem. So I'm going to go back to uh, just a micro and bloom base and probably a few organic additives added in. So you said it's not nutrients aren't really important to you. What, what's your thought process behind that? Because uh, I've ran through so many nutrient lines. I mean, from canna to GH dry powder to gh liquid uh nectar for the gods biobiz um house and garden i've i've ran so many and advanced advanced i use their big bud and overdrive in the past i have not used any of their bases because usually all the bases are pretty similar when they're in a liquid form unless they're organics and they start to get proprietary so basically all these nutrient lines out there you're saying are basically very, very similar to the fact where... Yeah, yeah. Based off of my experience and what I've seen, the nutrients don't have that much of an impact. I'd say the environment and uh, just the grower's eyes is way more important along with genetics. What about flavor? Flavor. I ran the nectar this round and I mean... The flavor, I mean, the only thing I've noticed is that it cures a little bit faster. It's easier to get to that point of smooth smoke, if that makes any sense. Gotcha. So many plants are you growing in your operation? I have uh, 15 in flower, and then the rest uh, are up and down, you know, based on need. You must be growing some monster plants to cover 5,000 lots with 15 plants. Uh, yeah, they're pretty big. Usually the typical yield, if it's not a cookie strain, it's a half pound per plant. Damn. How many plants per light then? If you break uh, that down for me. Two, two to three. Two to three, gotcha. Something around, along those lines. Some are bigger, some are smaller. Anything you'd like to change uh, that you haven't tried yet in your setup? Um, I really want to try out LED lighting. So I did grab another light from uh, Pacific Light Concepts to try out their LED. Um, and you can see how that, that works because uh, she grows dank. She, you'll see a few of her videos on my channel. She has like a four by four tent and she has all of the uh, Cree cobs to chip on board lights in her tent. And I've been blown away by the results for uh, low wattage, 600 watts is putting out like, you know, a thousand watts could. And I've noticed that she can run a little bit higher temperature and still get really, really good quality. Oh, the Citizen, I have the Citizen Cobs also running in a little two by four closet. It's kind of like my little test area for 
um, new incoming strains, new genetics that I uh, test out and uh, confirm myself. And that thing has been performing just as well as the, the Cree cobs, and it's about half the price, I think. So you're saying you do you test out all strains in a little small area before you go to a big room? Um, most of them, yeah. I with the uh, the genetics, you don't, you know, all new genetics, you don't really know what you're gonna get, you know. So for me, it's important to uh, verify the quality on my own, see it firsthand, and gotcha. and I have a uh, two by four closet that's just set up with a little 200 watt um, Citizen Cob light, and then I have the uh, the She Grows Dank tent, which is a four by four, and we do testing in there before they make it to full more more full production in the the bigger flower yeah i mean it seems like the smart thing to do now i know you also do some breeding as well right yeah right yeah square one genetics before we get into all that actually just kind of a a basic question how did you first get into growing and then maybe after you know you kind of answer that then we can kind of get into the the whole breeding thing so i first got in a very young age i had cousins who were a lot older than me like but about four years and uh so they had more readily available access i guess to it and uh, <laughs> so i just hang out hung out with them and you know smoked my first time and uh i liked it and then uh i took i don't know i stopped smoking for i don't know somewhere around eight years and then i started smoking again and i was just wasn't happy with the product it was very in inconsistent i never knew what i was going to get it was like playing the lottery every single time and yeah, that gets real old, real real fast and so i said you know, i'm gonna grow on my own you know i'm gonna do it on my own so i started with a little 400 watt ceramic metal halide in an attic and uh some pineapple express that was my first successful grow completed yeah. all the way through grow was pineapple express because who doesn't love that movie that's one of my all-time favorites to be honest and then yeah flowered that out and just kept expanding slowly from there you know one night at a time reinvesting so how many years have you been growing now uh, over seven now consistently back to back no no gaps just do you have a job down. too or is it just strictly growing i used i used to work uh 12 hour days i used to have work like six days a week 12 hour days but and then i knew eventually that if i just kept going and uh kept pushing that eventually I wouldn't have to work anymore. And eventually I got to the point where I saved enough money where I could say I quit. And so I left. <laughs> and now yeah. I just, I grow on my own. That's all I now do. You're, now you're living the American dream, bro. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah. So now you're focused a lot on um, breeding and creating your own genetics and stuff like that. Is that correct? You can kind of tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So the breeding, I, I, I had a, a few crosses that I did in the past. Um, just for my own personal like some cam dog double diesel cross with like a blueberry strain but that was about two years three years into my growing career and then i wasn't taking it seriously at all and then now i the same kind of thing i was getting genetics that and clones that i wasn't really happy with you know it was a a crapshoot when i would try to get a clone that's labeled cookies and it looks like blue dream you know what i mean i not unacceptable in my eyes and so Really, with me, it's about having verifiable, um, solid uh, genetics. And now, you know, it, this is like the perfect opportunity for somebody who want, who want, is interested in seeds to get them because they can literally see it grown right in front of them. And then, it, you know, you know exactly what you're getting, which is what I always wanted to have a good uh, handle of what I'm dealing with. And that is super legit and especially like being i'm on the east coast i'm in new york dude i've seen people will call anything a cookie strain that they right, have it's right. just everything's cookies like so what you're doing is pretty sweet it's uh definitely yeah. adding value to the growing community by providing like good genetics it's like you're basically going to show everybody what you're growing on your youtube channel and then yeah you can see any any strain that has i have ever released you can see on my channel or many pictures of it uh, through the Instagram account as well. So it's all verified and it's all there for you. Do you like throw down like your grams per watt and stuff like that for people like the side, like, I don't know, you see that type of stuff and you're looking for seeds sometimes. Um, n- no, because the phenotype uh, variation is 
hard it's hard to tell you know you you can get a big yielding cookie pheno but you might have to hunt through 30 seeds to find that pheno or you might get lucky and get it in only a, a five pack you know got you because they are f1 uh generation it's just next level shit it's over my head almost man <laughs> 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 Where are we at, Mr. Grow It? Uh, so we want to find out what the biggest yield is today and, you know, how much juice were you running at the time? Biggest yield today. Uh, let's see. I think my biggest yield was like 9.87 pounds Woo! from uh, the five the five lights. Wow. Which That's is, fucking... which is it's, it's okay. You know, some, some people these days are claiming over three. So, I mean whatever magic juice they're feeding to their plants i want some i know it's not mammoth bee <laughs> <laughs> oh shit we love you mammoth bee don't take it too, <laughs> <not> too bad <laughs> so five thousand let me get this right the, the five thousand watts basically you're saying you had lighting and you got over nine pounds yeah 9.87 uh 9.9 fully manicured trim tried nice ready to go it's legit man that's that's wild what was your uh what was your biggest catastrophe in growing Biggest catastrophe. Oh man. Um, powdery, powdery mildew and late flower. Um, and with my partner, we had a, uh, a grow like a big, bigger garage grow. Um, like I said, it's on my YouTube. Um, but yeah, we had a bigger grow and then late in flower powdery mildew would, was showing up and little, you know, it looked like powdered sugar at first. I didn't know what it was because I was still new, newish to growing and identified it and all we could do was do a hard leaf strip it was about day 56 of flowers so we were really close to being done so we did a hard uh leaf strip and uh wiped with hydrogen peroxide on leaves that we couldn't strip so it's kind of like a salvage situation it's like oh crap we gotta save this crop as much as we can did you did you save it like did you yeah. make out with yeah yeah the product ended up being completely fine nothing got to the bud but on the uh on on there's a lot on the leaves like the bigger major fan leaves and i feel like uh that's kind of what like the fact that you were able to proactively know what like you figured out what to do very quickly which is good i i know i've met a lot of growers who didn't do not figure stuff out that quickly and then a small you know powdery mildew turns into an entire does that like a your biggest catastrophe doesn't really sound that bad. You, you took care of it. Well, in, in a way it was just because it, um, all of the work that it took, you know, can you imagine wiping like every little, you know, every little uh, single serrated leaf that comes out of the bud, like just to make sure it is what it felt like, you know, and then um, it's just all about doing your research. Before I even started growing, I would read and read and read and read some of the information has not translated over because it is the internet but uh right. most of it has and i'm very 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 thankful that the internet is even here today to be able to absorb the knowledge that i've gotten for sure bud washing man we learned about that the other day right <laughs> mr crow bud washing uh, yep i have not tried it what do you guys think about that yeah or nay what do we what do we deem i, I can't remember um we see a lot of people doing it nowadays um right. there was some concern about people you know washing off of trichomes but then there's the argument well and you know outside it rains all the time Are those wash off the trichomes no so um yeah there's a lot of uh a lot of debate about bud washing so i've never tried it so i, I can't really speak too much about it yeah I, I would think that it's fine to be honest i think a lot of people might get upset by hearing that but the trichomes are not water soluble themselves so i think a quick dip in the pool really wouldn't do much to be honest so you guys heard it wash your butt <laughs> i'm not saying wash your butt no. i'm not saying dude i'm just saying i i get it you know i understand the logic behind it right no i do too it, it does make sense if done right i mean you know somebody out there is going to wash their butt and then put it in a room that's 70 percent humidity and ruin it absolutely yep. <laughs> they're going to get mold and bud rot and they're going to be very unhappy right but they'll learn so if you could this is one of my favorite questions on the podcast here if you could go back in time uh with the knowledge you have now right you go back in time and talk to yourself before you started your first grow what advice would you give to yourself that's a good question i like that one um wow uh 
start breeding now. I mean, you know, that's the best way that I've done everything when it comes to growing is to just shut up and do it. Just start doing it. Get your hands in the dirt, so to speak, and just do it. And I wish I would have started breeding sooner so I could get more of the uh, hands-on experience and, and knowledge. Yeah, I wish I would have started taking breeding uh, seriously sooner because I love it. It's it's very fun to, uh, one, create your own strain and, and two, see it come to fruition right in front of you, you know? You've never like accidentally wrecked a crop by like getting male pollen into your flower room? Uh, n no, I have uh, only have one little breeding chamber, four by four, and it's constantly being exhausted. I would say maybe if the fan went out and um, the tent was open, it, it might, but uh, I don't think there's enough negative air pressure in the other rooms to suck it, you know, into those rooms. But luckily, I haven't had that catastrophe yet. I guess that would be a good story if it did happen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't. So you get all that pollen right, exhausting yeah. up into your attic. So just don't grow plants in your attic and <laughs> you should be good to go. Yeah, right. What have, we've gone over pretty much everything. We went, we went over, you're using, we, we know your nutrients, right? Uh, nectar for the gods? Yeah, and um, I'll be running just cutting edge solutions, micro and bloom. Really, I think if you stick to micro and bloom and then kind of work in um, organic additives, you'll have phenomenal results as long as your environment and your genetics are there. What temperature do you try to keep your plants at in bloom and what do you try to keep them at in veg? And do you control your humidity with a dehumidifier or anything like that? Yeah, so the temperature I like to run in flower is 78 to 81 degrees um, because mainly because I have CO2. Uh, so I run it a little bit warmer than traditionally and then in veg, I'm I'm not too worried as long as it doesn't get above uh, like 88 degrees, and then I will start to freak out because yeah, it's a little too warm. But I try to keep it yeah. um, below 88 and anywhere in there. And then um, humidity is controlled by a dehumidifier, but I really don't start running the dehumidifier until about week three of flower because I'm trying to push that um, VPD, the vapor pressure deficit, in those first two weeks especially because that's when there isn't any kind of bud on the plant at all and so I try to do that you know run that like 70 I usually keep my um, humidity 10% lower than my temperature and that seems to be a pretty good range for me that seems like a great rule that everyone can write down keep your humidity 10% lower than your temperature um, and VPD can you can you go a little bit into that for me um, VPD, my understanding of it is it's the vapor pressure deficit of the, the leaf in the room. Um, I could be wrong, but, and then you're trying to keep the somata open in order to absorb more CO2 and, um, increase and in drive photosynthesis. So, uh, I've seen good results ever since I started run, running with it and going along with it. And plus my electric bill has gone down because I've been able to keep the dehumidifier in like 70%, um, humidity but uh one thing i have noticed is i need to keep my nighttime temperature in check i try to keep it between uh 65 and 70 when i am running vpd and then the last two weeks i just try to suck out um as much moisture as i can to hopefully uh induce trichome development because of the uh the dryer so like when you say you're running vpd you mean like you're just running a, a humidity that's 10 percent lower than your than your temperature throughout up until week three of bloom um i'll run that all the way until the last uh i would say two weeks i run that the whole time as long as my temperature isn't dropping at night where that's where that controller comes in clutch and really really handy is it it'll turn off your exhaust fan once it reaches that uh lower threshold because if your temperature gets too low then you're t you're worried about pottery mildew or even like rust right. and fungus our butt, butt rot is a uh, concern because the colas are usually um, dense and, and tight, tightly formed. Indica dominant strains are really susceptible to that. And that kind of, I feel like this kind of goes against what's traditionally like done in bloom. Like most people say to lower your humidity in bloom, correct? Yeah, usually people run like 76 degrees and like 50% humidity. But if you look at the VPD chart, that falls almost right in line to being in in the uh the green zone as so to speak of where you should be 
but yeah, I pushed mine a little bit, my humidity a little bit, um, higher than traditionally followed. So if your temperature Absolutely. is at 80 degrees, what is your humidity at? 70%. Yeah. I'll set my dehumidifier for 70 and then it'll usually keep it right around that 65 to 70% range. A lot of people have the knowledge that if you're running over 60% humidity, there's a chance of getting powdery mildew. So you're running mm -hmm. it at 70%. How are you preventing powdery mildew? Well, one way would be to keep your nighttime temperatures warmer so you're not uh, creating that environment for the powder powdery mildew to grow because usually um, hot and cold don't mix for um, the grower, you know, and you'll, you'll see people will run their con their lines outside or they'll be sucking in cool air from outside and they'll have water dripping from their, their ducting because it's the hot and the cold air meeting. And in that area, that's where you get problems. But uh, one tip that I've found that works extremely well for keeping powdery mildew at bay is foliar spraying with uh, silica. I know it's not really doing anything um, to the plant because it's not really a plant available, I believe, with a, a potassium silicate. But I use a potassium silicate and I spray it on my plants anytime I do a foliar all through veg all the way until I hit flower and then I stop. But what that's doing is it's changing the the pH of, of the leaf and creating that barrier on the leaf itself. And ever since I started doing that, I have never seen one little speck of powdery mildew at all. That's awesome. I never heard that before. Yeah, me neither. That's a pretty good tip. Yeah, absolutely. So you said you're referring to nighttime, so you're doing 18.6 for veg? Yeah, 18.6. Right, well, I run 20 and 4, 20 on, uh, 4 off in my little veg area, which is just a 1,000 watts and then a 100-watt uh, like uh, Spectrum King Light. And then um, in my main flowering room to cut costs because 5,000 watts, I run 18.6. And then as I'm getting closer to flower, like a week before I'm going to flower, I lower the uh, the nights or the day time by an hour, like every other day or every day. Oh, so you ease them in. Yeah, I transition into the, uh, just like outside, they transition into the the flip, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, it's cool. I've never done it before, but I've heard of people doing it. And I guess if, unless somebody does a side-by-side, -side, we'll never really know the if it truly right. makes a difference. But Well, I, I figure I'm saving on an hour of electricity, you know, every single day, oh. and I don't see any negative, negative results from it. Yeah, that's true. It seems like you have your shit dialed in pretty good, man. Thanks. Uh, yeah, hopefully by now I would, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's upcoming for you? Um, are you working on any projects, uh, you know, within the industry or anything? Um, upcoming, really just trying to work on the, the genetics is a very high priority for me. I've, I've invested a lot of my time into the genetics, the square one genetics, and really just be able to provide that transparency and the results that people can see. And um, just in my flowering, I'm just transitioning over to the LED. That's really my only two bigger things right now, I guess. And can you, uh, you're on YouTube, you have your website. Yeah, YouTube, uh, THC Titan. Um, and then Instagram, same THC Titan and Square One Genetics. And then uh, www.squareonegenetics.com. Awesome, dude. Yeah, you have some really good Instagram pictures. I'm uh, pretty new to Instagram. I followed you, you know, a few weeks ago, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. Really quality photos. Um, so if you guys are on yeah. Instagram, definitely follow him. Uh, if you guys are on YouTube, I mean, you've got uh, how many videos do you have on your YouTube channel? You have over 100, right? 100 and something. I, I'm not even keeping. I think it was like 120 last time I looked. Ton of videos. There. Ton of videos. So you've been around for quite a while on YouTube. Uh, very yeah. well experienced, a lot of good knowledge from you. So um, definitely follow this guy and, uh, you know, pick up his genetics. Appreciate it. Cool, guys. I think uh, this is a good time to wrap it up. Yeah, good thing to wrap it up. Any final words from anybody? Um, just thanks thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. You know, it's nice to talk to like-minded people and, you know, really just get my word out there, I guess, you know, and hopefully uh, create a uh, – what like a, a tidal wave of the same momentum with other people making ensuring the uh the quality integrity and transparency with genetics and just growing in general for sure man and i just want to say one thing everybody go go buy your genetics from 
this guy because you really don't want to run into having shitty genetics because you can have everything else perfect and then you have shitty genetics you're screwed so get get them from this guy he shows you uh he, he shows you them and he, he's obviously here to try to help everybody as you can tell so that's it all right well thanks for coming on man appreciate it yeah thank you guys take care guys